So welcome everybody. I just will say very briefly a couple of things about the, the sort of Buell Center's um, interest <laughs> and commitment to, to, the, to this kind of a discussion. Uh, first, you know, first of all, to acknowledge uh, the, the ongoing collaboration with Suzanne on a, on a project yet to be fully unveiled uh, <laughs> uh, to do the, that in effect continues our um, our work on housing uh, that may, some of you might have encountered at MoMA or elsewhere uh, in the last couple of years. Um, for us, that this sort of housing question in its many variations is, is central to not only uh, who we are and how we are uh, today, historically, but, but to, to the way that the, the fields of architecture and urbanism and associated fields and practices kind of um, hit the real world. Um, uh, but about also, I did. I also wanted to to, to just celebrate uh, as as a now former editor of a, of a, an independent or semi-independent journal. Uh, I, I really did want to also take the opportunity to celebrate this this publication, this particular issue, uh, but also uh, the very existence uh, of of independent journals like Candide. Uh, I know from experience, some of you do too, how hard it is to do this kind of work. And, and so I think, you know, that, that, that's sort of doubly why we, we thought it would be terrific um, to, uh, to sort of, you know, um, act as co-hosts of, of this uh, event. Uh, beyond that, I don't really have uh, any, anything uh, profound or, or, you know, kind of uh, world historical to, to discuss with you right now. I think that uh, I will leave to Suzanne and to uh, our uh, our colleagues on the panel, and I will then kind of recede into the background as kind of a moderator, hopefully fielding questions from you, uh, uh, all of whom I, I know are in one way or another also interested in this incredibly important subject. So, so Suzanne will take it from here. Thank you. Does this work, or should I hold this? So good evening, now you know who I am, I'm Suzanne Schindler. Um, thank you for hosting, thank you for introducing, um, and thank you to the panelists for coming out. Um, Hilary Sample, you may all also know. She is here both in her role as an architect and partner or principal of Moss and as a coordinator of the housing studio at Columbia. Um, and also <laughs> for the speculative designs that you did uh, and are going doing, for instance, in the foreclosed, where you address some of the key issues of private and public, um, who actually pays for ins infrastructure, how does that all intersect? <coughs> Claire Weiss, um, sitting right here, is the founding principal of WXY, Architecture and Urban Design, which focuses on creating innovative public space structures in cities. Um, Claire is closely involved in working with agencies, um, federal and state and all kinds of agencies, so I think that's very interesting thing we can talk about and um, of seeing housing as part of a larger larger planning um, effort. To my right is Gwendolyn Wright, thank you for coming out as well. She's a historian at Columbia, you probably all know her as well and I would cite three reasons why you should be here <laughs> or why you are here. Uh, one is she is an expert on housing and the author of Building the Dream, A Social History of Housing in America, which is a, a key um, seminal book. and. As an undergraduate, I read one of your other books called The Politics of French Colonial Architecture, which to me was an ex exemplary way of relating design and, and policy. And um, finally, you actually remember the 70s, which I think <laughs> you can uh, tell us a little bit whether we are, how we're thinking about this time. So I'm gonna briefly introduce the, the issue and some of the, the arguments that are made there, and then each of the panelists will briefly respond um, hopefully provoking a good discussion as to why we should look at a period or a turning point 40 years back today. So um, <coughs> just quickly about Candide, it's a peer-reviewed journal founded in 2009, um, published twice a year in German and English. Um, next. Oh, there is. Oh, perfect. Great. Um, so it is issued in print, as you can see. Um, and the first five issues were designed by Katja Gretzinger in Berlin, and the next five are by Ben Critton, who I don't think is here, but he's a New York-based um, designer. And online, we are open access, so after 12 months, the content is available for free. 
This is the first issue, so issue number seven is the first thematic issue, um, and it was edited together with Anne Kochelkorn, who's an architect, uh, architecture critic and historian based in Berlin and Zurich, who has since become a full-time editor, so she was a guest editor on this. Um, and the issue, as you know, is about the crisis of housing production in the mid-1970s and its effect on architecture discourse. So it was key to us, to how do you link what actually happened in the mid-70s to how we act and think as architects today? Why the mid-70s? Um, two, two trajectories. One is a cu cultural change, and one is an economic change. Um, a nice combination of um, images that are both, you can see the curve. Um, and so the, on the, the cultural level, I, I hardly dared to show this picture because everybody's seen it so many times. But on the one hand, in the mid-70s, already much early in the mid-60s, large-scale housing, large-scale referring both to numbers but also to the size of the actual buildings, had become a lightning rod for, for a social critique. Um, and this was not only the case with public housing, like in places like St. Louis, um, but actually there was a group of Columbia professors and students who were very agitated in the mid-60s about the planning for co-op city, which was uh, cooperative housing exists to this day. So um, this, this happened in basically all cities. You can find a large-scale housing estate, and that catapulted a whole, a whole discourse. Critique was lack of self-determination of residents, alienation, re lacking relationship with existing cities, and waste and profit-making of for-profit construction companies engaged basically in the industry of building. On the other hand, we have the second trajectory, was, which is the economic one. And beginning with the 1970s, um, like 1971, the dollar was decoupled from the gold standard, at Bretton Woods, and basically that created a whole um, repercussion of inflation and um, global instability. In 1973 was the OPEC oil embar embargo, which created a big global recession. And basically with this end of um, revenue for na nation states came the end of the um, supply side welfare, st uh, supply side Keynesian welfare state, which had been the basis of large scale housing production. Um, and in these two graphs, uh, you can see how 1973 really marks this turning point in how much housing was produced. On the left side, it's a uh, number of construction starts of housing um, in France. Uh, so um, the dashed line is single family houses, the solid line is multifamily houses, and on the other side you see the same for uh, West Germany, that it just rapidly, rapidly dropped off. <coughs> so then there was another turning for the US, a, a key moment with the moratorium on subsidized housing construction the beginning of the Nixon administration in 1973, which basically froze for 18 months all subsidies for low and moderate income housing, um, which also marked the end for this kind of large-scale co-op city approach, which I alluded to earlier, but it also marked the end um, of more um, innovative ideas of how to reform large-scale housing as manifest in, in, a, in a scattered side approach in the, in, in the Bronx, Twin Parks. Um, also here in the room today is Juliet Spertus, who I've been working on, on Co-op City and Twin Parks. So, back to the issue. In selecting, the issue is based on a conference we organized at the ETH Zurich about a year ago, which was precisely about this turning point, and um, we selected five contributions for publication, and the first one basically looks at the relationship between social sciences and design in housing. And um, the authors are Ignaz Strebel and Jane Jacobs. Um, Jane Jacobs is Jane M. Jacobs, <laughs> so no relation to, <laughs> to <laughs> our Jane Jacobs. She's based in Singapore, Ignaz Strebel's in Zurich, um, and um, they've been working a lot on high-rise housing and so uh, biogra ethnographies and biographies of, of high-rise housing worldwide. And they looked at the work of a little-known geographer who worked in the mid-60s on a broad study of high-rise housing in Glasgow. And she, so Pearl Jeff got, um, the background of social science studies and housing was satisfaction research. So basically, 
the background was you ask residents, are you happy? Do you like your apartment? What do you not like so much? In a multiple choice kind of setting. And she realized when confronted with, uh, with the massive housing that it was just impossible to collect the kind of data that would allow for that, um, uh, for some kind of standardized uh, evaluation. So she started experimenting with different methods and writing in different ways about the relationship of the uh, building, how users use the building, and it developing a more ethnographic approach. That never really, um, so just back one more. What you see at the top is a, is a formula for elevator waiting times. Um, so sh there was sort of an attempt to, to quantify all of this, but she started using photography. And what you see on, the, on your right side is basically Miss so-and-so of Winford sitting in her apartment in the 20th floor with no view, and this is actually the view that, you, that she can't see. So she sort of, Jeff caught demystified or pointed to the disconnect between architects' um, intentions and how people actually lived. Her work was never received um, because it was eclipsed by work of Alice Coleman or Oscar Newman, who mo had much more um, one-liner and fast-to-consume uh, argument of bad buildings cause criminal behavior. And, and so, th but they, so Ignaz Schreiber and Jane Jacobs revisit Jeffcott to say there, there was sort of an approach there that was much more um, fine-tuned or nuanced. Uh, the, next, the next article by Hélène Jean Janière, uh, who, who teaches in Paris, um, is also about the disconnect between sort of sociological discourses and design discourses. The example of Grigny la Grand Borne, which at the time it was built, was received euphorically by the architectural press. Um, and you, as you can see, it, you know, it's no longer orthogonal, it's all round. Um, it was talked about as a, as a town and not as a grand ensemble. But basically, again, in 1973, it's sort of really, <laughs> it's the you can find all these things. There was a film done by a, a, a journalist and a, and a critic, and it basically exposed and interview people and uh, how, how terribly miserable everybody was living in this town. And um, uh, so basically her piece is about, it's impossible since then to connect these two, uh, sort of the aesthetic uh, criticism of architecture and the social criticism of everything else. Um, then third article is by uh, André Bidot, who looks at the continuities in um, Unger's work. Um, and Ungers also has a very close biographical relationship to large-scale housing. He was a, uh, an architect of a large satellite town outside of West Berlin, or in West Berlin, and uh, he was a teacher at the Technical University in Berlin. And there was so much student unrest at the time that he basically fled Berlin for Cornell, <laughs> where he stayed for 10 years before returning to Germany. But So there, there was a key thing. So, but um, Bidot shows that the, the ideas of Ungers um, and his attempts to work with housing and within housing. There was a much larger continuity than is generally thought. And the image on this is from a book, the back cover of a book that Ungers published with his wife, Lieselotte, about communes in, in America. So they did a historical study of, of communes from the 16th century, or no, the 16th, what is it, the 17th, the 18th, <laughs> to, <laughs> to, the <laughs> to the present. Um, and this was uh, part of his entry for the Roosevelt Island competition in 1975, where he starts, uh, launches the idea of the urban villa. Um, and in the images, th these are designs for, for the Märkisches Viertel in Berlin. This is a continuity of cluster typologies and how to, how to organize that. And this is a little known project that he did with students in, in Cornell called Self-Help self Housing. And I think it's actually quite wonderful to see that they built these prototypes of plywood and two by fours. Uh, I don't know where they built it, in his backyard, uh, probably. So basically this is about this shift or questioning the shift, the assumed shift towards a discourse on the autonomy of architecture, which is attributed to, to Ungers and Rossi and other people, uh, postmodernism. And uh, Bido argues that's actually also more nuanced or didn't happen in such a black and white way. Um, fourth article is, um, about Swiss mass housing, and as you might imagine, mass housing in Switzerland is not quite as large as in other, <laughs> other places, um, but there was a key player, who was, it was a private company called Gönne, and he used the same prefabrication methods as in, in France, so concrete prefab, and he built uh, 
totally for-profit housing for the middle class. And Patrick Schöck uh, sort of questions, is it possible to, uh, to, to build quality and quantity at the same time? So this is sort of a typical effect of the, the you know, the sort of perfected floor plan and then the attempt to do variations with the standard. Um, but what's critical about this for this whole debate is that Goethe became the lightning rod for <laughs> student revolt in, in Switzerland, um, which I'll get to in a second. Um, so basically these pictures contrast uh, marketing of Goethe himself, this is the happy family, and this is a film still from one of several movies that were made in the early 70s, um, again interviewing the residents, showing how miserable the mothers were all alone with their children in, in the satellite towns. And then the final <coughs> article is an interview with Bruno Reichlin and Jörn Jansen, um, done by Anne Kockelkorn and Axel Sova, um, another editor of Condit. And the, the key thing here is, and this is actually the origin of the whole conference, that in the early 70s, 1971, there was a big political blow up at the ETH in Zurich. And it was all about, uh, even in Switzerland, there were some student unrest, and there was huge political pressure to democratize and make more transparent what was going on at universities. And as part of this effort, there were a series of experimental studios or seminars introduced. And they brought in um, some sociologists, some architects. One of them was uh, Jörn Jansen there in his young years. And in this experimental studio, students decided themselves they were going to study the housing estates of Goethe, the ones that I just mentioned and published a book in consequence which had pr three print runs and was sold out in within a year, I think 30,000 copies and sold, about the uh, really terrible methods that Goethe used to buy land from farmers and you know, push all this through and how, how he was sort of a wheeler and dealer. Um, and, um, but the mo main point of the university is that Janssen was kicked out um, within a year because it was said he was doing Marxist ideological um, agitation, and this had nothing to do with education. Um, <coughs> so, and Bruno Reichlin, who you see there, he was an assistant um, professor, and he was instrumental in bringing Aldo Rossi to Zurich um, as a guest professor, and that was a very key move because Rossi was both a communist, so it would appease the left-wing students, but he was also not one to write a lot of books, but one to actually focus on design and morphology and history and, and, and so on. So. That moment, again, mid-70s, marked also a shift in the pedagogy, not only at ETH Zurich, but I think at many schools, uh, towards saying, okay, we, we can't deal with all these sociologists anymore. <laughs> let's just focus on design. Let's get back to the project. And that later was and still is talked about the autonomy uh, or autonomous architecture, the architecture being something that's independent of the, the social or cultural or demographic or financial um, constraints that, that shape it. Um, <coughs> so here you just see, uh, on, on one hand, uh, the sketch by Rossi and an image of all the people who worked on his um, Milan uh, Triennale. And here, from that publication I just showed you, it's, a, it's, it's very classic that the, the, the general contractor lives in a villa. The, um, the renters live in one of these uh, estates and the workers live in the barracks. So that, that's sort of the kind of uh, um, argument that made. All right, so um, that's the issue. I think some of the things we can talk about is how much of this shift in the mid-70s is, is still with us today? Like how has that framed us in moving forward or thinking or conceiving of so-called housing versus architecture, or how we how approach these things? Another thing is this basic disconnect between, let's say, empirical research, whether that's social scientists or else, and, and the design disciplines. Like, how does, that, how does that come together or not, or where do we stand there? And of course, the third thing is, we are again at a point of um, where s some of these efforts actually look quite good from today's perspective. They actually produced quantities of housing, and actually the design wasn't that bad. Um, so what is it, um, after 40 years of deregulation, uh, do we need to reconsider the role of the state and also the role of architects? Okay. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, should I just go ahead? Yeah. Um, then thank you. thank you very much, Suzanne. I think that you, you raised a number of 
Where does this turn on? It doesn't sound like it's on. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, I think you raised an, a number of really interesting issues for us to consider today, but I'll, I'll try to take up one of them to start off, um, which is what we gain and what we lose by trying to focus on a particular year. I mean, to, to shift from 73, there's been a lot of talk, <laughs> ongoing discussions. 1968, this and that happened. And it's always been a focus on the radical ways in which architecture was transformed, in which the society was transformed, in which youth culture made um, France and um, Germany and the United States be different places. And yet, we don't look at the fact that what happened in 68 that's really powerful is Richard Nixon was elected president of the United States. And that happened with the support of the so-called silent majority who were very angry about the entitlements that he was giving to the poor, and uh, as they put it. And so I think that it's, it's a challenge to all of us to try to get beyond a sense of any one thing characterizing um, a moment in time or even a decade or even several decades that way. And in terms of, of 73, I think that, uh, that we have an, a, a real challenge for all of us of seeing the ways in which there was simultaneously, but to some extent differently in different places, um, the growth of what came to be called postmodernism and that continues to be one of the red flags for many modern architects who see that as being the loss of, of architects having a sense of, of, of ambition, having a sense of purity. They, they put it in formal terms and they see that as a, as a deflection. Um, the assertion of autonomy, and there had not before that been a notion that architecture was totally separate, even among the, the most uh, um, uh, heroic architects, that the sense that because of the demands that the society was putting on the profession, that architects could claim to be pulling themselves away and even say that's what they should be doing. And that, I think, is one of the issues that we ought to discuss. How, how do we make a case for standing up against that? Um, the other, which you've mentioned before, which I think is important, is to see the rise of environmental thinking. And I was actually at Berkeley, both getting an MArch and then staying for a PhD through that decade of the 70s, beginning in, in 72. And that was one of the main things that we were thinking about, but it was always with the notion of asking, how did you use data and information? Uh, and in fact, the person who was the head of what we called design problems, of asking how do you bring together research? The question is again fundamental today. How do you try to learn about what exists in a larger culture and then what exists on the ground at a certain place? Uh, a man named Horst Riddle, uh, who was Swiss. <laughs> uh, and, uh, he was German, but he'd been, he'd been in Switzerland before that. And he spoke of them um, in, a, in a very compelling way as wicked problems, uh, as causing difficulties uh, for architects who didn't want to be confronting the kinds of, of, of instabilities and indeterminacy of, of what they would try to have a solution which could not then carry through with what their intentions had been. Um, and of course, as you had said, one of the major factors was Nixon then declaring a moratorium on all public housing and all community services, which had a devastating effect in many ways, um, in particular because it pushed public housing with the Burke Amendment uh, to say that it had to be taking care of the people who were the most needy. And that basically meant young women with um, young single mothers on AFDC who were supporting their children and they could not have men in the unit. So it was part of oh, this Moynihan uh, critique of the, of the loss of the black family, but it did lead to what then came to be called the warehousing 
um, in public housing, and an even stronger, as we all know, critique of what public housing was doing. And uh, I think the, the degree to which that political repercussion of a decision that was made, or two decisions, one of cutting off any kind of, uh, of government funding, and then of demanding that the public housing that existed had to be serving a group that desperately needed it, but therefore preventing any possibility of a mix, not the kind of mix we have today of this um, um, multiple income <laughs> in which you have subsidies for, uh, for market rate housing in these mixed income so-called public housing uh, uh, complexes, but a demand that public housing had to be dealing with a problem, and that was one of the reasons why Nixon said, architects are not able to resolve any of these problems. And it actually was, was his, he made the statement that has come through in 1968 with several statements about urban problems in the United States that were critiques of modern architecture, saying in particular that Korb had caused these problems with the whole notion of the, of the, the tower in the park, and a, a very simplistic critique about what modern architecture was about, and I think it led many architects to either retreat from wanting to make an engagement or to find some way of having environmentalism become an alternative. Mm -hmm. And I think for, for many of them, especially in the West Coast, environmentalism became a way to try to find um, a, an exciting alternative to what had been a social and political ambition in the past, and it uh, led to too many people believing that you could create a kind of architecture that would, again, resolve major complex economic, social, technological problems, uh, and not facing the fact that 1973 was also the first year uh, that there was a book that said one of the major aspects of carbon footprints, as we would say today, is architecture. That um, the amount of, uh, of, of effort that goes into creating materials, moving materials across the country, um, of tearing down existing buildings and then building new ones, that there wasn't a full enough realization um, that there was this counterbalance in terms of looking at, um, at, at architecture and the environment. And the, the critique of, that's part of what you had raised in terms of seeing the oil crisis, did not fully get across to architects, even though there was information that was being posed that, uh, that our effort to see this nationally and transnationally was a major problem. There, there were almost no uh, um, efforts on the part of architects, um, certainly not in the East Coast, but not even in California, to think through how did we try to address that by reusing buildings, reusing materials from buildings that had been torn down, by becoming more imaginative and how we would think through things like that. Um, and I think that uh, the degree to which it pushed many cities and states New York in particular, to try to invent interesting alternatives. And probably the, the best example of that is the UDC, the Urban Development Corporation, of trying to invent alternatives for funding and for finding ways of approaching modern architecture that would be new, varied syntheses of modernism and responsiveness toward environments toward, um, toward social issues, toward particular cultural groups, there were some interesting experiments, and those have been just erased from our understanding of what was going on then. And, uh, and so I, I think that there are a lot of possibilities from my experience of seeing people during those years trying to find ways to believe that it was possible to be an architect and to be a modernist um, uh, in, in particular,
but to find ways that would ground what you were doing uh, in terms of, uh, of, of less hubristic approaches to what architecture could be. And so I think that the, um, just very quickly to, to, to make a, a shift on that, we tend now, looking back at the 70s, to focus on the grand um, um, and grandiose public uh, interventions in terms of performance centers and, and sports stadia and uh, governmental buildings and campuses and so <coughs> forth, and to see the housing of the era as being timid and awkward. But in some ways, the, the very effort not to try to solve problems in and of themselves, but to build up knowledge and the various ways of trying to exchange information and, uh, and think about how to analyze that. It, it was interesting that, um, that Candide does not have an article about the US because I think it was, for many people in Europe, in my experience going to Europe during those years, um, was an intriguing alternative. It was frustrating and, and upsetting in some ways, but it was also intriguing because there were people who were trying to balance the social sciences with a sense of history, to balance design with a sense of community engagement, and uh, not looking for a specific solution, so much as looking for an ongoing approach uh, to how to, uh, it, it, in terms of how they could approach uh, architecture. I think we're at a similar point, and, um, and this is, is perhaps one of the most exciting aspects of the present day. Um, we're not going to have a new approach to architecture so much as we're going to try to find ways of building, melding, juxtaposing, and hopefully learning from and analyzing the kinds of architecture that are being produced. But the last thing that we need is the technological bit um, that the awareness of the oil crisis left many architects trying to find some solution to that. It's much more what uh, I think is the more positive notion of what could be ways of trying to simultaneously find local, national, and global approaches uh, to, uh, to systems of production. Um, to ways of looking at people's notions of culture that would be local and specific, including even some identity politics about that, but also get beyond that uh, and think about <coughs> transnational approaches to that. Uh, and if there is anything that I think would be intriguing in terms of looking at this very quickly <laughs> this afternoon uh, at, at Candide, it's to try to, to maybe um, all of us say, what are the themes that go across these case studies? Because they're basically case studies. And, uh, and the, the 70s began a turn toward the social sciences as very specific case studies, but there was a turn away, and there was a reasonable <laughs> turning away from the grand narrative uh, explanation of what to do. But the real challenge for all of us now, I think, is to say what are several different possible narratives to carry through that time? What are several different possible ways of seeing that in the, the present day? And how can we try to look back to that moment and learn something from it, rather than simply being either critical or celebratory, but what is that, um, that edge that can come with seeing a place that is outside of what you had posed? So are, are we going on this in terms of chronology of, of who's yeah, the next the old person? Next? So Claire, Claire I'm the next old, okay. Claire, do you want to go there next, go. just in the sense of, um, or do you have some images you want to show? Yeah. Because I think this would be a nice way of looking at both Okay, How you were, really were engaging yeah, that really period of time <laughs> and, and since then. Okay. Okay. This may be a little bit disruptive relative to Hillary because I'm going to.
talk more about just kind of the crises of now, I'll call it. And I think that, um, just a, kind of a second on Candide. So we all, we all, you know, I reviewed it, but in a lot of ways for me, it was really the social science angle. And, and the first article, um, I know I can't believe it's Jane, Jake, Jane M. Jacobs, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> on um, Pearl uh, Jepcott, and in a way, her law, I'll call it her lost research, but the, the, a research that actually is, in a way, very contemporary, and which is to kind of look at architecture as as much a, uh, a lab or a, uh, a kind of, as its own environment, and for architects to be able to then, and social scientists, to look at the architecture of there and to try and mine it for meaningful data. So, I mean, in a lot of ways, metrics have taken over architecture, and they, and they have for the last five, six, seven years, as we've been able to kind of have nice uh, parametric tools for gathering and doing other things. But th the truth is, is that means that, that things like high-rise buildings, where you can, if you're a developer, you can look at the metrics one way, which is how much profit, how much thing, what the cost benefit analysis is gonna be, your government, you can look at them one way, but really if you're an architect, and if you were, uh, it, and if Jeff, uh, Jeff Cut was working today, she would be able to, with tools she has now, take her elevator uh, data, wait times, and sort of, in a way, look at that in terms of all sorts of wait times, like the amount of time, now that we have cell phones and everything mm -hmm. else, we, we now, that, those times that, the time people spend as how architecture defines space and time, really it seemed to me that that's what she was getting at, and honestly, defensible space, and really never really got to it the way she did, and I think there is a kind of reassessment now going in architecture about the space and time we spend in buildings and neighborhoods and spaces and the value of that space and time and how housing, architecture, retail, street cities do that. So um, I wanted to sort of put up a set of images of Red Hook, not because Red Hook is the only place in the world, really, and, you know, Honestly, the Red Hook houses were not built in the 70s. Well, actually, a couple of the buildings in Red Hook houses were built in the early 70s. Uh, they were the later stage. They were finally built. They were not designed in the 70s. It was started in the 50s. But that the kind of contrast between what was possible in high-rise housing, elevator-driven housing, versus extending walk-up housing from four to six to seven stories began to be realized in New York, and what happened, whether it's Co-op City or Stuyvesant Town or Red Hook Houses or Smith Houses, was the, the idea of um, housing being separate from the city, which obviously people rallied against in Switzerland, and that was middle income housing, the idea of well, taking away from rallied. everyone rallied. But in a way, despite all those rallies, the, that space between housing projects, social housing, and their, it, their own neighborhoods has n hasn't been solved, and here we're 40 years later. But the latest crisis, which um, I would call the climate change crisis, because we still haven't gotten back, you know, we still haven't gotten back any, uh, how, the kind of programs pre-Nixon never returned. Mm -hmm. The exactly. techniques that we use in terms of the metrics of real estate have been used now to try and solve uh, social housing in an incredibly incremental way. So our latest kind of is in fact back to environmental and can our environmental issues actually now coming maybe full circle, it's not just an, an energy crisis, it's a crisis, the energy crisis is now existing on many levels, how, how does that then kind of inform architecture as a discipline? So I'm just quickly gonna show. So anyways, this, these set of slides was a um, quick study 
within something that had nothing to do with housing. This was a study um, as part of the SIRR, and if any of you have read the Bloomberg uh, um, administration's report post Sandy, which is the strategic initiatives for uh, recovery and resilience. This is the Brooklyn Queens chapter of that. And this wasn't, I don't, this is not, didn't really make it into the report, but it was in studying what the surge and flood levels were actually doing to Red Hook. Red Hook, Hunts Point, many other places in the city didn't actually have a solution that could be, except you build a 14 foot high wall. There was no solution that was easy to understand because these are places that are below sea level. But there are also places that, whose proportion of um, uh, social housing exceeds 50% of the population. And this is also true uh, in the Rockaways. So there's <coughs> pockets in the city that are incredibly vulnerable and they're vulnerable in terms of climate and they're socially vulnerable. But in a lot of ways, um, the issue is not only water, the issue is really social resiliency. It's like, who do you live beside and who can you talk to and where's your clinic and how do you know how to get out of your neighborhood and how do you know to leave? So in a lot of ways, the, these diagrams were showing that, that Red Hook houses and Brownstone Brooklyn were awfully close together. It's just that you had to walk underneath all this infrastructure and that, um, and that, in fact, those resources, if you can look at anyone that you has been to the G train at Smith and Ninth, you start to understand that, in fact, our islands of housing are not separate. And even in the, the, the way we look at housing as a separate topic in architecture is exactly a simulacra of how we look at housing in the city and how we look at affordable housing inside housing when it's really living. We don't use the word living anymore, but, but I think what Jeffcott was getting at was she wanted to understand in an analytical way what living was in, it happened to be tall buildings. Mm -hmm. And I think in a sense that's really the urge right now is to understand in, in terms of this crisis of climate and also the incredibly data rich culture we live in and access to data. How, how are we living in the physical constructs we have and how can we take advantage of what is actually in general lower density, more green space uh, places that whose patterning has created a, a kind of branding for architecture and a branding for planning that belies the actual living, the metrics of living that, that cities need, which is affordability, opportunity, uh, landscape, um, uh, social economies. Because it turns out, and I thought this is one of the most interesting things in looking at a lot of the um, really health statistics that came out post-Sandy, was that there was, not the effects on people were just as marked. It didn't matter your social income level. There was a lot of people who were elderly who actually had enough income, who were, who were isolated and were not able to access care either because they paid for services. A lot of people who were not paying for services, who in fact were on a barter system or were connected through other social ties, in fact, had a uh, quicker, they were able to get their medicine back up, they were able to connect much faster than many uh, of the same people who actually had been paying for services and their services were down. And in a lot of ways, I think uh, architecture and how we look at how different um, services, I'll call it mechanical, electrical, plumbing, everything, that we are, we're going to have to peel back and perhaps it look, it's environmental, perhaps it's in terms of metrics, those layers, and start looking at the kind of living systems of buildings and how to make those much more connected uh, and more efficient, in a sense. But it's not the hallways that are gonna be efficient anymore. It's really about how in various unknown situations, our buildings are more flexible. I think that was, yeah, there we go.
can sort of see what, what that study was about. But, but this is, um, anyways, we weren't supposed to do this work on resiliency, but actually in the end, I think that's all that it's about. It's really about uh, kind of remaking uh, a lot of what we think of as kind of these systems and really looking back at, at um, the social sciences is not being separate from it, but in fact, completely tied to how a good architect would be. Thank you. Too long. Yeah, no. Okay. Um, <coughs> maybe I'll just show one or two things to get started, but I also just wanted to say thank you to Suzanne um, for inviting me and, and for Reinhold too for your comments coming, but um, it's great to be part of it and I really uh, enjoyed uh, reading the issue and I think for me there were two, um, two chapters, let's say, or parts, um, you know, because I very much like also the way that the issue is constructed around essay, uh, media, um, fiction. Uh, I think it's super fantastic and interesting. Um, and, and so for me, I, I agree, I mean, I think the, the, the part about um, the, the kind of first essay, Peoples and Buildings, People and Buildings, um, Science of Life in High Flats, and this um, topic of satisfaction research um, uh, was, uh, uh, you know, just an incredible title. <laughs> and uh, something that, uh, as I'm teaching this semester, uh, directing the housing studio, uh, we are one week away today, actually, from the final review, so. Um, I'm feeling for everyone working in the studios at the moment, but the kind of, you know, I think it's a very difficult um, subject to work on, particularly at school, but one of the things that I think is incredible about, I'm going to diverge just for a few seconds to talk about the studio and housing at GSAP, um, is that as part of the core, um, that's very much about a different way of looking at housing, I think both based on the history of the studio, which we look at a little bit, but um, it being in the context of Manhattan, uh, being urban, and then of course being within the setting of Studio <coughs> X, and how, um, you know, how housing as a, as a thing uh, is studied both within a core, but also looking at and how it can be, how Studio X and advanced studios can push back into, into that core. So I think that's something that um, seemed to me to be also somehow in the in the articles as well the kind of play between those those things the world at large um, how, how you make housing um, so one thing that I, I've always uh, been intrigued by and and also just very much liked as a drawing on the on the left side um, this is a project uh, Robin Hood Gardens by Allison and Peter Smithson um, so before uh, the 73 date, I wanted to just go back a little bit um, and, and start before and sort of set up a kind of problem um, in that, you know, we know that these, these projects, specifically the ones the Smithsons worked on, received criticism as well. Um, and uh, one of the things that, you know, has always struck me is this kind of split between art and life. And I, I have to say, I haven't been a total believer in it, even though, um, you know, I think these things exist together. Um, I think they always have. Of course, they're, they're, you can't deny the autonomous project, but um, so I think it's just something that as architects, uh, we naturally sort of uh, look at and, and deal with. And I feel like in a way, I don't feel, but I think that the Ungers, I'm um, sorry, we're in, we're in the US, so I'm, I, my pronunciation is terrible, but, but I'm just gonna go with OM Ungers. And uh, you know, that, that in, in that essay um, that, uh, we can we can see some of some of these social issues within that um, as well, and I think it's probably a, a struggle. But I, I do think that those things are, are in there. And um, uh, in, in any case, I think what's important about this drawing, and I don't know, can I point with this, Carlos? Or <coughs> it's the the green thing. Is that yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. So this space, this is a diagram that um, I believe Allison Smithson drew um, of the context. So the, the building is actually not here, but you know it. You know it's around this circle, which is this green, this green mound. Um, and the drawing, which unfortunately you can't read, it says stress-free zone. Um, so she's she's thinking about this idea, um, and they're talking about it in their work in building this kind of space around the housing um, that's very much about has to do with health. Um, uh, it has to do with a kind of context. Um, even the, the drawings are, are almost in a way like footprints. Um, so this idea of walking, which has become more and more 
um, let's say, a contemporary uh, problem or uh, solution uh, in looking at the making of architecture. But I think, um, and then there's, there's views and the, the kind of acknowledgement of a kind of industrial um, port or landscape around as much as it is a kind of urban one. Um, so for me, this drawing sets up um, th these kinds of issues and, um, and it goes forward then even with after the kind of criticism of the project, Alison Smithson, I think in a kind of questioning of the, of the architecture and the practice, um, writes uh, something called the bylaws of mental health, which are these, these kind of uh, points or guidelines, um, design guidelines even for um, rethinking housing. And, and, and partially, you know, I, I've read somewhere that it was sort of out of guilt for um, realizing that you know, maybe the projects didn't, uh, didn't live up to this, this kind of expectation. Um, so I, there's so much to say. I feel like um, I, I don't want to um, take up too much time. And then, um, you know, so then that, that leads in a way, this is the, the first page of the syllabus for the <laughs> housing studio. Um, it's called Different States of Housing. Um, but it, and we work in East Harlem, um, so, uh, which is the second after Brownsville. And Brooklyn uh, is the second largest uh, aggregation of public housing projects in the United States. Uh, so a kind of tough um, context, but super great history in terms of, of really understanding the problems at hand and where East Harlem is going. Um, and then this term also, the urban design students are also looking at that. So a kind of coincidence, but um, good uh, sort of chemistry. But what this also, what it includes is a competition uh, from 63 uh, East Harlem um, housing competition. Um, some of these things got built, some did not. And then uh, the MoMA show, also 1973, um, which is another chance for housing. And in that, I think it's interesting, the introduction, um, Arthur Drexler, who was then the um, I main kind of curator of the architecture department, um, uh, says, I can find my notes, um, it talks about uh, a, a quote, urban public housing post-World War II concentrated on high-rise apartment towers, often independent of the street pattern, communal, ho and then goes on to say communal hostility in part was due to overpowering size and personal character. Um, also, it made it difficult for parents to look after children at play while a dependence on elevators and extensive public corridors created problems of security and maintenance. So I think some of those things play into um, you know, the, the first chapter about science and life uh, in high flats. So um, I think I will uh, sort of just then end with um, a kind of question. This is a, not a great photo from the, from the perspective, but the kind of swath of public housing that came about in the 40s um, in East Harlem. Um, oh, sorry, I went to the wrong direction. Over here is the Central Park. Um, kind of map uh, showing Upper Manhattan and the divide uh, for East Harlem, which is here, um, down to something like this, 96 to about 145th. Um, Marcus Garvey, which um, as an urban project was never blown up for Fifth Avenue, but had to go around it. Uh, and then to, you know, so then to bring it back to uh, today and to talk about uh, these crises, which some have already been mentioned, but the issue of foreclosed. Um, also then after Sandy, but just also thinking about students today and um, issues that they're dealing with, um, you know, uh, ideas of social media, how does this affect housing, um, you know, that does the social in fact replace the urban, and then what does, what does actually space, public space mean in the context of housing? And I think as I've been going through the term, I've been thinking more and more about that we're not just teaching housing, but we're also teaching um, issues of public space, or should that be part of um, the kind of pedagogy and the questions? And um, uh, I think those are there's some more more comments and questions. Here. Could I just take that up because it, it seems to me, in all of these decades of <laughs> thinking about housing, that um, the only way to do it is to think about public space. That ultimately housing from the Middle Ages, when the term came into use in English, uh, it was about the public space. It was not about the units. It was understanding, in a way that we still use it for the housing for wiring. Um, that it's, it's maintained a place in our language in terms of an enclosure, something that is uh, the, the larger setting for things that have a life of their own. 
And uh, it becomes essential, I think, for trying to understand the design of housing in the studio or in any kind of project that, we're, that one might take on uh, to see the degree to which it's not the units, but those are important. And it's certainly not the facade, although that's important. Uh, but it has to do with the kinds of internal public spaces mm -hmm. and then the, the ways in which a site plan connects that to mm -hmm. surroundings. How do you enhance the surroundings mm -hmm. and how do you, in doing that, find ways of having some connections? Mm -hmm. and, it, and it raises for me something that, in all honesty, I'm still troubled by, which is the other Marcus Garvey, yeah. <laughs> the one out in Brownsville, right. um, that is, I think, 73, right? Yeah. Um, in which it's Ted nice. Liebman and, uh, and yeah. Kenneth Frampton did right. what they felt was a wonderful, mm. perfect, low-rise, high-density um, housing project. And it's a disaster. Mm. Um, it is considered by people who live out there and people who work out there worse than the public housing towers. Um, in terms of crime, in terms of, uh, of people who just leave it and who won't live there. And, and I'm not sure personally what to make of it. How do we see the degree to which something that had um, very good designers with a concept that was a very positive one uh, that turned out to be negative? Um, so I'm curious, what, what do well, all of you think? I, I so think that, that we're still grappling with the fact that, um, <laughs> I'll answer <laughs> that one. <laughs> yeah, that um, those questions, I think, in a way, are highly problematic because pruitt uh the, the history of it, it was incredibly successful. It, right. it, it actually was a great building on both levels, uh, you know, in terms of just its understandability as architecture, but also the life of that place. And I'm sure to a degree, Marcus Garvey was for a couple of moments. It's really all about it and various buildings. Uh, if you know you have doormen and you have maintenance and you have and people have a degree of um, security, housing security, they're not going to get kicked out. All of those things are not under the control of architects. So the idea that you can make autonomous architecture in light of the fact that none of those factors are within architecture's control, which sort of gets back to um, your introduction, which is the idea that, ar that architects, in light of this fact, they, they were faced with incredibly debilitating losses and what looked like something that was just a disaster and it was something that it was just they couldn't control the factors. They basically, and same with planners, there was a huge retreat from, and, they, and it was this idea that architecture was there for its own language. But in a lot of ways, that, that's what I, I'm reflecting on the 70s. That, was su that is such an incomplete answer. But I mean, I, I, <laughs> you know? I think Marcus, Marcus Garvey has a terrible management that has nothing to do with the architecture. Well, well, so in that sense, exactly the architecture. It's a combination, from what I gather, of, of the management and of the fact that the design with the Muse design actually created really difficult right. security problems. But only in a case where there was no management or a support for tenants. I mean, right. Right. Red Hook Houses has, way, has no front lobbies. And it was built w without the help of, um, you know, any architect that we know of today it was really a, a kind of cookie cutter. It was, there was architects, but it was, and part of the problem is there's, it was more efficient to have millions of little stair halls that didn't go to any streets or any sidewalks. So right now, when, when you have to go, when there's a, um, you know, a power shortage or there's a flood, of course you can't figure out how to find anyone's unit because there's about four entrances or five entrances to every building. Now, if you were, that's got to be worse even than Muse You've got to see why that has I mean, seemed a good yes. idea, right? But no, well, in that case, I think it was actually <coughs> the cheapest way to build housing at the time. And it wasn't seen as a priority because the idea was that people could work out, you know, they get to know each other in the building, they work it out, and it would happen. But I, I think that there, to me there's, Muses, courtyards, elevator buildings, none of that has 
in the right circumstances has ever been wrong as in terms of architecture, but it may be wrong in terms of a ter certain part of the city if decisions go a certain way in terms of, it's really about typology, I think, in neighborhoods, not typology in buildings. Well, I think you're, you're totally right. In fact, the reason I pulled out my phone was an unsuccessful effort to look up the date right. of, of a book by a woman named Elizabeth Wood, who had mm -hmm. been the head of the Chicago Housing Authority, mm -hmm. who had taken this very strong pro-Corbusian stand in 49, and who then, in 1966, um, said, no, I was all wrong. And, uh, and I think in the early 70s published a really thoughtful book um, that, like Catherine Bauer was saying, there's certain kinds of things that work well for people who have money and have services, but don't work very well for people who right. don't have either one. And we have not yet, um, as architects and planners, fully enough taken, because we're so afraid of, of seeming to be labeling people Mm -hmm. We're not actually taking full enough account of how to make certain things work for the, the groups you have. I, I have a suggestion. First, how many architects do we have in the room? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, you know. <laughs> Um, no, because le I, the first suggestion is to, su to, su to suspend that identity for just a second um, and, and in that sense relieve oneself, ourselves of these burdens uh, just for the moment. Um, and, and widen the frame a little bit to the kind of, the, almost in the opposite direction. In other words, the way that discussing this issue leads to the kind of matters that concern citizens, that concern political agents and participants in society, as well as experts who have been tasked, rightly or wrongly, with solving society's problems. So, you know, so for example, one of the other um, things that happened in 1973 uh, was that Nixon started the EPA, uh, the Environmental Protection mm -hmm. Agency. Uh, and, and that was uh, maybe, you know, Gwen, I'm sure you would have something to add to this, but the, uh, one of the, the, the suspicions on the left was, was that this was, this was meant to, def to, yeah, def to, to divide uh, the anti-war um, sentiment, you know, the kind of anti-war movement mm -hmm. and civil rights and all these other things. And what's interesting to me, if in a sense what we're already starting to hear is that, you know, environmental design, sustainable design, ecology, et cetera, is to, to architecture's, is architecture's problem set today. It is to architecture today what housing was back in, in those days. Then it, at some level, we have, precisely because we, in a sense, took the bait, uh, have our, find, our, find ourselves repeating, in effect, Nixon's narrative. In so, a technocratic way. Yeah, and, yeah, often in a very, in a, even more technocratic than in those days. So, it would, that's why it, it would, it's interesting to me to ask, not so much what you can, you know, in the real world, how are we gonna do this, but how does the world have to change such that uh, these problems cease to be technical problems? In, in other words, they, 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 they become the question that a citizen uh, confronts. Uh, what you read about in the newspaper, you know, they, they, in other words, how can posing questions to do with housing ultimately lead to, the, to, to reopening these kinds of uh, other uh, narratives, rather than taking for granted the, the terms that they've left us with. Do you see my, my question? Well, I think that, that social scientists are already answering some of those questions in that they, uh, whether it's Eric Kleinenberg or various other people, their studies of like the heat wave in Chicago mm -hmm. or others are basically saying that, that the way in which people's actual social connections, which go beyond architecture, but do have a lot to do with cities, actually, are the measure by which how much money various governments have to then rescue them. There was this sort of construct that housing is about rescuing people, which it never used to be until Nixon yeah. basically cut off all funding. And it used to be a expectation that part of what, what a city does is it builds places for people to live and part of what we do as a government but that sort of got all torn apart so now we have this that same construct about is really in our crisis management FEMA you know yeah. like we're uh, all yeah. about 
We're only planning by crisis. Yeah, of course. So in a way, the environmental uh, questions are the same as the housing questions, Absolutely. except now it's as though what was cutting the feet out of housing is just spread to everything. So I think the crisis right now is the situation where here we're going to empower environment, but we're disempowering uh, social networks or social is actually what happens now is the plug is pulled on everything. We, yeah. we plan by crisis at this point. Right, so, so the- Housing crisis, any crisis is a crisis. Right, but then, you know, how does one respond to that? Does one accept those terms or does one uh, offer other narratives? I mean, that, you know, maybe that's a rhetorical point. The, the, the simple, the, what I was basically getting at before was-, was Gee, I can't yeah. tell Gee, what could I, which, which, one, which one could be, which one could I possibly be suggesting? Uh, you know, is, is the, the way in which architects kind of they, we browbeat ourselves to the uh, to the extent that I remain one of you, uh, an architect that is, uh, some of you, you know that we're so used to this browbeating and, and that you know we failed we fa you know and, and and these are the classic moments and this one failed there's a lot of finger pointing, uh, yes of course uh, at some sort of technical level th th there were mistakes, uh, but the the premise. Uh, the premise that, let's say, the, the, the premise that is sort of imperfectly visible in any of these examples, uh, and, and I think it is useful to contrast Europe and the U.S. at least, you know, historically right. in this respect. Right. I totally agree. Uh, the premise that things can change, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and and you know, and they perhaps can change for the better, and not only can they change for the better, they can change for the better for everyone, theoretically, in principle. Uh, which is the opposite of governing by crisis, is, is in effect to plan the change in some way, seems to be uh, withheld, that, that, that premise. But I, I think that's you know. what um, kind of so the sort of current thinking on social scientists, that is they're clearly proving that that old premise about architect, about form, having that effect. No, not the, form. The, no, but I'm saying the proof is that form, architecture yeah. as form, doesn't actually have that effect. So in the, our browbeating yeah. days can be over because it's actually yeah, yeah, very we, we clear <laughs> from, a, yes. from a, a scientific perspective at this point that it, it, we don't have that power as yeah. architects. Either way. So either way, it yeah. doesn't matter. Right. We don't have that power. So in fact, we can kind of go on to other things, which is being part of a larger, um, larger uh, academic, social, it means that students, I would say, mm -hmm at the housing studio can more broadly design and look at design process as something quite expansive mm -hmm. because some of the old um, ideas where people thought that form one way or other had any of that power are, mm -hmm. I think it's just clear that it doesn't actually, it, like from any. Yeah, but there's another, the, the other side of that, and I'm gonna keep quiet after this, but, but uh, we were talking about it in the housing studio with Hillary in, the, in one of these large discussions, <laughs> which is quite fun, was the question as, you know, as, as to whether things could be changed. You know, you know yes, uh, then if you say, okay, well, you, know, you throw up your hands and say, you know, I'm, I'm innocent and guilty at the same time. Uh, you know, the, the, the student, I think, is left in a, in a kind of dilemma. It's like, well, you know, I, I, then, then what do you do? You just do your job, basically. And if you do it in collaboration with, with a number crunching social scientist or something like that, that's fine. But, but uh, what's the purpose? You know, what's the, anyway, to the. To the well, well, let me give um, a slightly different example. That yeah. One of the people who I went to, um, to Berkeley with mm. in the 70s was a woman who was Argentinian who was trained as an architect and who then did a degree in planning and who became the, uh, the head, in the UN, the head of looking at disaster relief planning. Mm. And she said, she is so tired <laughs> of having <laughs> architects propose some new kind of housing that yeah. you'll bring into places that right. have disasters. Oh, yeah, sure. And she <laughs> said, it just means nothing. Yeah. That uh, it is incredibly indulgent. Now, I'm not sure what to do with that because, of course, you want to have that desire to make improvements yeah. be there. Right. 
But as she said, what has to happen is figuring out some way of making changes before the disaster happens mm -hmm. uh, and having there be ways in which architects can get involved in much more sequential um, environmental kinds of changes at a given site and having there be a different sense of timing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that strikes me as being a hard thing to tell people in a studio mm -hmm. that you'll have to think about things over a long period of time and doing projects that will work for a, a certain amount now and will work then over time. Can you try to make that argument to your students, do you think? Well, I think, I mean, I was going to respond more in terms of the issue of practice as, um, you know, actually practicing housing. Uh -huh. And as a young person, it's virtually, at least in New York, it's virtually impossible. Mm -hmm. You cannot get a project. Yeah unless you have already done housing, um, or you team up with someone who will do the inside, basically. So right. there's this kind of already terrible mm -hmm. uh, environment. But that said, I think that there is a new, I would say in the last you know 10 years or so, a new way for, and I think the people in the room even are thinking this way and practicing that American architects, young generation, is much more urban in their thinking and in their practice, and mm -hmm. it has to do with being more global. But um, you know, traditionally this wasn't the case, and that Europeans were always thought of as, it just went naturally urban, that you thought of the urban context in conjunction with practicing architecture, so that there was already this environment. And it, it, you know, so I think that that's happening more, and maybe that's part in part being enforced because of these kind of uh, crises that are happening. But, um, but that said, it's still, you know, probably this angst around architects continually proposing these things is because it's virtually impossible to get housing project to build unless you already have <laughs> them <laughs> in your portfolio. So you start with the emergency shelter and then you yeah. put that in the portfolio yeah, exactly. and then you go. Yeah, right, right. So there's yeah. there needs to be some uh, sort of opening up in terms of this as a as a possibility, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I, I don't know, shop now is just, they're taking over entirely. Yes, so I know. See, this is, yeah, I was going to say <laughs> that. I mean, I read about this <laughs> firm called Shop. That <laughs> they apparently have designed an elevator uh, building uh, or a building that is essentially an elevator uh, for humans, and humans can live there. Apparently, it's very expensive to live there. Um, <laughs> apparently, you know, and and it, architects don't seem to have a problem, and um, certain kinds of humans don't seem to have a problem living in high-rise elevator buildings. Right. There, there is a there is another subtext to this that that goes to to this collaboration with social scientists and so on in from those days. <laughs> in which there are different types of humans, basically. I mean, that, that's the actual story that's being, being written as, you Or know, different conditions of being human. No, no, yeah, sure, some sure, people of can course. Hack but it, some people can. Yeah, in other words, as, as the, the uh, you know, if you think about what else is happening in New York mm -hmm. in housing, in housing design in this period in the 70s, well, the Upper East Side is going vertical. The Upper West Side is, is, is going in that direction and just keeps going. So this, this, this is where the Marcus Garvey thing, the low rise identity, all this kind of plays into it because the, the claim implicitly is that there are different categories of, of human and some can live in elevator buildings and some cannot. I mean, that's essentially the, the, the claim, it seems to me. So, so the, I, I think there's an element of, you know, along these lines, it, you know, of, of architects are not qualified for this, that, that has to at some point take this on. Mm -hmm. Take on the massive expansion in the actual construction of units of various types according to a set of social codes and, and uh, norms and uh, that, that are often implicitly racialized mm -hmm. and, uh, and say actually this architecture, it, the funny thing is, uh, you know, has been anything but disabled in that context. Mm -hmm. Architecture and, and architects have been very, very active participants in this particular revolution. It just is not the revolution that the students at the ETH, et cetera, were, were envisioning. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it was for a different uh, group, mm -hmm. in effect. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that architects are there mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a perverse way. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, and this is really a little bit about the foreclosed mm -hmm. um, and the fact that it was sort of national. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that it's really important to kind of understand the New York situation at, in terms of being pro-development and mm -hmm. pro-high rises is so unique. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's San Francisco or whether it's Westchester, what you really have out there is not only a fear of architecture, a fear of building anything. And when you build nothing, you certainly can't build more affordable housing. 
you're really, and so I think what architecture is really is at a crisis where there is, a, you know, I'm talking about red state, blue state, there's a huge divide between kind of places that want to welcome people, want to grow, and places that actually want to stop architecture. So I think one of the kind of big crises, not to where the architects have too much, is that if you're at all interested that, that, place, that growth isn't bad, it's also a very difficult time to be an architect. Um, yeah. Westchester, with a project that Suzanne knows about, basically hasn't been able to produce 750, hasn't been able to produce 80 units of housing, and it has to produce, under court order, 750 units of housing in seven years. Mm -hmm. yeah. It has not been able to do it, politically, physically, mm -hmm. in any way. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? I mean, like, and San Francisco. It, San Francisco also is oh, producing at a very yeah. slow number of housing. Mm -hmm. You see all these articles about a uh, huge amount of social tension between the people who have high paying jobs and those that don't and the, the essentially lack of, and some of it over a lack of really uh, room. So yeah. I think that's also really interesting is that there's, there is a kind of, there is something going on with, that's really in a way ultimately anti-architectural because it's anti any kind of occupying buildings and form. Yeah, but if you're, uh, go ahead. Well, I, I thought of this in, in actually going to testify against a project at the Landmarks <laughs> Preservation <laughs> Commission uh, last spring. Which one? In which, well, this was a, this was a, a actually, I never thought I would be in the yeah, circumstance, right, but right, actually right. defending a developer uh, who wanted yeah. to speak against the effort to try to preserve all of West End Avenue, which to my mind is one of the most boring streets oh, no, in see, the city. And this that. was, but this was <laughs> the first step toward preserving the entire Upper West Side as a historic <coughs> district where there would be no changes yeah, there. Right. And therefore, you know, the way that we can see a negative aspect of how preservation can function as down zoning, so you don't allow any different kinds of people to come into your neighborhood. Right. And, uh, and that is distressing because I'm somebody who believes that preservation is very important. Yeah. And I think we, we're back into a, a new stage of seeing that as a conflict uh, in American cities. Yeah. And I, I don't know, again, I'm not sure what to say about it because there should be ways of wanting to hold on to and protect and preserve not just a few important buildings, but whole districts, but then to have there be some, some sense of seeing the resilience of how those neighborhoods can function. And, mm -hmm. and part of that is to move away from absolute control by, by, uh, by landmarks. Well, yeah, I'm probably everybody here, I don't know, we could ask the architects for <laughs> had some experience with landmarks. Um, I, we should open it up, but I, I wanna also just, as we do that, um, also, take the invitation to think about European examples in America one step further um, and, and, and try to accumulate some other examples uh, from uh, the rest of the world, uh, perhaps, at least in our mind's eye. Well, I, I, th I think yeah. Gwendolyn's first comments were actually quite interesting in questioning whether it's helpful to look at a specific date, because yeah. on the one hand, uh, so, much so many different things happen but precisely that's why it might actually be helpful. <laughs> we we, yeah, we, no, we have, like we have fine, Nixon's right? yeah, idea. No, no, listen, I mean, what I was going to say. Oh, what, so the, the other thing is uh, you sort of suggested that we have to move beyond case studies, yeah. and I would suggest move, finding a way to move beyond, let's say, the Western European and the American, North American, which yeah. is yeah. the only example. So how do we actually do that transnational? Yeah, it's hard. It's, it's hard work. Yeah. And also, I see somebody from Newark sitting in, or actually, oh, good. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I mean, again, so New York is so exceptional, yeah. and, um, and Newark is 15 minutes away, and it's a totally other story, so how do we, how do we talk yeah. about that? No, that's for sure. I mean, yeah, no, I can remember. But one quickly thing I think I could say, I wanted to say about, about this periodization thing uh, that, that I was, was thinking when I was saying, you know, think a little uh, more widely geographically is that uh, you know, you could argue, this is an old Frederick Jameson argument that the 60s really ended in, in the early 70s, mm -hmm. and, uh, and you could accept that or not, but, but um, it is important that in the background, and, and I think if people have alluded to this, is the, like, this idea of like the 60s that set up a series of uh, struggles, crises, events, 
Um, but, but there are parts of the world that didn't have the 60s. What reactions against you know? them, too? <laughs> no, but they just didn't have it. And the 60s were just a decade, right? In the same way that, you know, maybe the 90s will be seen at some point. But the, the you know, what, what this, 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 this is a very Euro-American uh, sort of concept, the 60s. Uh, nevertheless, there were consequences, as I was alluding to. You know, in, you know Vietnam was suddenly... Uh, in, on television, in you know, uh, American living rooms, in some of these housing projects too, uh, as as part of the, the extended reality of like the '60s in this particular geography. So it'd be interesting to think. I mean, so I'll give you an example. Since there was somebody who, who's working in Singapore here, once I had the opportunity to get a tour, a systematic tour Amazing. of all the social housing in Singapore. I mean, not that every building, but you know, the whole history. You could do it from the airport into the city. You can follow the sequence. From when, and you know this. Don't forget, this is Singapore, authoritarian, uh, you know, sort of uh, happy, uh, you, you know, feel good. Or what is that? Can, this is satisfactory. This the consumer satisfaction yeah. survey, yeah. you know, in its <laughs> kind of most extreme form. Um, uh, and you could, but you could see it typologically. You could see it, and the, the work is being done, and has, you know, it has has is being done in a fragmentary ways by people around the world on these on these. Sub we were just talking about. Uh, Florian Urban's book about uh, called Tower and Slab, and slab. Uh, about that goes through a number of also of case studies uh, around that one could add you know like this this is a sort of elaboration of one moment maybe in in that wider picture but anyway I wanted to, I just wanted to in effect remind ourselves that that even the the, the sort of historical arc that that this periodization marks is not the same when you move it sideways or you know north, south, east, and west. It, it crisscrosses, but it, it's not mm -hmm. uh, analogous. So anyway, any any thoughts from the architects or others in the audience? Uh, Newark, will Newark speak? <laughs> You've been invoked, Gabrielle. Uh, Newark has no Newark tore down its tower. Yeah. So it's so interesting to think that we're in this when we look at these projects in the seventies and even um, if they're regarded as failures, quote unquote, they're still here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I was just reading, I, and this may not be true, but that virtually all of the public housing that are built in New York is still. Yeah, in New basically, York, it's New York, the only one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> New York um, is a, luckily, actually, is a Hope Six failure. Yeah. Hope Six okay. basically decimated Newark, and Newark I would. Newark is a Hope Six failure, too. It yes, just it just that it actually, is. it got Hope Six hunting that, that's because, um, New York actually uh, didn't allow demolition. It, like there was a kind of conflict between losing it. They couldn't figure out how to move the units over and demolish. So they spent so much time arguing about it. By then, the program was kind of over. <laughs> 1999, right? Sort yeah. of says nothing can be torn down right. at this point. So and so it was a kind of a. Sometimes that kind of preservation is good. I'm yeah. not saying that it was. Wonderful that but it is also happen. worth yeah. noting that that in Chicago, on the other hand, um, now is the home to the uh, Museum of Public Housing, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, which to me is is one of the most poignant statements in the statements oh, in this is. respect. But I, it's I, also, you know. in, in fact, I think yeah. important that it's 1930s public. Yes, it's in the it's in the, it's in the early yeah early yeah, yeah, stage yeah, right. because of the horrible way in which the destruction of what were some right. negative projects like Three Green and, yeah. and Robert Taylor, but what replaced them was, because I know from having written about it, I got these angry letters from HUD saying, these are the solution to public housing. Well, a solution in which you took 4,000 units of yeah, housing and, and, and you yeah. actually had at best 1,000 yeah. units of public housing and the rest of it was subsidies for for market rate housing. And this is, as I think that the, I, the premise that you're starting from is the degree to which the sense that supporting the market is what architecture should be doing. And we could maybe come back to that too. Um, how we can try to suggest alternatives to that that aren't the shortcomings. But who can think to, to this point that you were raising is very good outside of the U.S. and uh, and Europe. Um, anybody want to make a comment? After all, '73, you see the the fall of dictatorships. Yeah, um, a lot of Brazil action. A lot of action. Yeah. Um, 
Um, there there's some other things in <laughs> South America. <laughs> yeah. we have the <laughs> so, so how do we, how do we see um, that here down. in terms of major changes in the world and architectural responses to that? What would you say? Uh, see, I got put on the spot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we have a Japan expert over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I actually, um, I'm writing a book that manages to different features in a very prominent way. Uh -huh. um, that is on actually um, how the Obrise Algiers project, you know, large, unbuilt, very yeah. famous yeah. project for mega structure, um, really migrated to Japan through an architect of Obrise. Mm -hmm. And the book is a, uh, it's a plug, a, a survey Go for of it. a dozen projects that are all built examples of trying to implement this idea. Of Interesting. Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, you know, one of the, uh, I'm tempted to ask you to fill in the, 
or to help us fill in the information on the political economy of Japan, which is following the lead of the United States uh, for obvious, maybe obvious historical reasons, uh, in in you know implementing quasi-market models that contrasts, you know, basically you have these two post-war reconstruction programs, the in in Europe and and in Japan, and and they can be compared differently. If you if you roll your clock back a little bit to the earlier, to the beginning of the careers of the of people like Tange and so on, there Tange is of course trained in the U.S. So you know you can follow your I'm sure you're doing this, but the genealogies and and the question that that I think needs to be asked is is what kind of, a, what I, I keep asking this, or trying to ask this in different ways, what sort of a system, what kind of a world system does this particular building type bring with it or imagine? In other words, yes, flexibility is, is all good, but, but the, you know, the assumption that upward mobility uh, is going to occur in, 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 a, in a sort of um, coherent and society-wide society manner uh, is not actually the assumption of the political economy, uh, the political economic model on which that particular reconstruction project, uh, it was based on consumerism and, and the industrialization of, of the economy uh, that, you know, uh, structurally uh, exacerbates certain uh, divisions even as it reproduces, you know, it produces a middle class and hence, the, you know, the need to, to be flexible. So. You know, if you think part of thinking outside of one's box is also to think about what the consequences may be elsewhere for some for, for our our security, for example. Um, but it has a lot to do with um, our kind of economic structures. And one of the things I've heard lately is about certain countries experimenting. We we think it's a big deal to talk about minimum wage, and we think about housing as something you subsidize to kind of bridge the gap in terms of. But there's a, a number of um, countries that are looking at the idea of minimum income of simply sure, no this has been a very income. yeah and once you're not this is a very controversial proposal right, but once very you're not important. subsidizing yeah. buildings which yes. you're subsi you're yes, actually creating Italy, yeah. a baseline for people that means they have the means to spend right. their money in the way that it creates a more vibrant actually physical and social right. network and that would open up for me that would be the hugest change one could imagine is to actually in a way uh, stop looking at a kind of our limited American way of how we we invest in buildings versus yeah, although, investing in. Although I mean that's that's the whole demand side, supply side. I mean yeah. Nixon is the one who started the housing voucher by saying I'm giving you a yeah. choice, I'm giving you the money, you yeah. go live where you want, right? So I mean in a sense it's an expansion of that. It's like you just get money, you can spend it however you want. But the question is still, is anybody is the market actually going to respond and produce the housing, produce enough housing because from the market, it's good to have a scarcity yeah. of housing, right? Because, and, and places like New York, mm -hmm. if you don't regulate it, you, you will just, you know, you'll just charge as much as you can for the housing, whether that's a, you know, a micro unit or whatever. It, it, the size isn't gonna matter, so. But that, it's that location, really so. One of the big questions right now, which is. So it's, but I, th I, I guess I think, um, I guess we should have invited a policymaker. Is there a policymaker in the room? Oh, no, no, it's okay. I mean <laughs> no, <laughs> but in terms of... Um, um, we do that all the time. <laughs> it doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't get anywhere. <laughs> you have diminishing, uh, no subsidies for housing, and we're cutting out any kind of things like a food stamp program. So uh, in the end, I think we're not... Yeah, we're not basically, we f yeah, no, sorry, th this is the neoliberal economy. Basically, that's what was invented in 1973, yeah. roughly speaking. Mm -hmm. And it, it was planned. All of this, this Westchester thing, that's a plan. The plan is that there's not housing for these people who are being, you know, mm -hmm. sort of named as such. And, uh, yeah, and, and that's the, pr the product. This is a very, this is why, you know, architects are participating in, in, in something that's very, very systematic and quite revolutionary, actually, it seems to me. Uh, but it, it's doing all the things that you're describing, you know, a, as it were, by the book. And, and so the question is, can you change the plan? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that, that's, you know, uh, and what do you need? What tools do you need? And clearly it's not going to be just like a, a building type, but, but it does actually lead you to that question. Yeah. Um, so, Dan, I really appreciate your very
seems to me that because she is doing the exercises, it would be more profound than that, uh, in the sense that actually we are doing like, for instance, physics as an economic object, but actually maybe now, You think that we are overcoming? No, I, I mean, what do you think? It's, 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 it's because I, 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 there is a sort of optimism in the table of uh, like the <laughs> <only> emergence of, <laughs> of, of, or, of the opportunities. I mean, I mean, the economic process. So. Well, I, I think that uh, you actually made just now a very interesting <coughs> distinction between advantages and opportunities because there are certainly opportunities. <laughs> and there are opportunities mm. to build for architects, and there are opportunities to make money for people who are investing. Uh, and uh, they aren't necessarily advantages for the vast majority of people who live in cities. And, um, and that's perhaps a very important thing for us to keep asking ourselves, what are, um, the ways in which, as architects, we can try to uh, to keep delving into the, the sense that those will be the same, and instead to ask ourselves and to ask other people what are the possibilities for making opportunities for people who, who aren't brought to the table on that, and making advantages for people who aren't the, the usual uh, groups who would benefit. It's a, it's a very, I think, a very important distinction to make. Sometimes in, in searching for the right word, we often say something very important, and that's mm -hmm. an example. So, are we ready for wine? <laughs> yes, yeah, perhaps I so. think so. It's sitting in the back, but before that, you have to buy a copy of this journal. Mm -hmm. yeah. There it is, back there. Well, I, I will only say on that that it's a very interesting idea to have a journal in which there is commentary, internal commentary yeah. about it's looking a lot of work at. This. It's a lot it's of work. Good. It yeah. is, yeah. Uh, and, and in really two languages, shows. two languages, in two languages, two languages. Language. Yeah. but to actually then take up where architectural journals have gone in the last forty years, because uh, this is also a period of time where that's been happening, mm -hmm. and to say that that just raising the issues that you raised, that a number of people might have raised, but looking at things that aren't brought to the table in the discussion um, is a very important part of doing a journal. How can we try to think about journals and architecture that open that up? Um, if only we can simply say that it's possible. So mm -hmm. thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank so you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.